All right. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks for organizing. Special thanks to Alex for uh, steering me on to uh, submit to here. Come by. <laughs> so, um, so this is um, our post-processing uh, evaluation project, where flew a bunch of different drones over the same site and then ran them through a bunch of different software. So. Uh, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge some of the people like uh, Jen Perkins and Steve Rook and uh, Les Higgs all through drones that day and then uh, some of them as well as Corey Ross and Owen Strachan at GOVC helped process some of the data. So um, before we start, how many people have flown a drone? Okay, of those people, how many people have flown a drone on autopilot? Okay, all right. Cool. <laughs> One more question. How, of those people that just had their hands up, how many people knew how to automatically override that, the automatic mission and stop it? <laughs> oh, oh dear. <laughs> okay, the rest of you better uh, study up. Okay, so I, I think uh, making orthophotos and DEMs from, from drones is really uh, exciting and it's why I started flying drones because that's, uh, that's the information that I want to get. Flying the drones is uh, just a means to an end. Although sometimes uh, I get accused of just enjoying myself too much out there. <laughs> but <clears throat> I think one of the things that um, we have to keep in mind is that orthophotos and DEMs are sometimes a little bit hard to share. And they're a little bit hard to interpret for people that aren't kind of cartographically inclined. And so sometimes what you really need is a, is a, per, is a, is, you know, a fantastic <coughs> photograph from the perfect perspective of the issue. And then you can pass that, you can pass that around on an 8 half by 11 at the meeting room and everybody can, can contextualize and can understand the issue. So, for the photos and DEMs, one way to use uh, drones. So, this is a, not a perfect shot, but uh, it's the only one we had. I think we were kind of sick of flying drones this day. Uh, so this is kind of our study site. So there isn't very much relief, but you can see it's a mixed forest and uh, road and some uh, open area of the river and the rock. Okay, so the objectives were to, uh, to assess the accuracy of these derived products of the orthophotos and DEMs. Uh, oh yeah, we say RPAS now, that's remotely piloted aircraft systems. So uh, I think it's because of the Trudeau government we've gotten rid of that gender charge language, but it's also inaccurate. It's not unmanned. The pilot is just remote. Remotely piloted aircraft systems. So this is all the, the new, this is the new term. Uh, and, uh, and software. So, so our idea was to uh, minimize as much of the other variables as we could. So we flew all the drones at 100 meters, 75% overlap. Most of the flights were uh, undertaken with the same autopilot route. We do have some, uh, some issues that will come out in a moment there. So the site is mixed, forest and open. And uh, lots of times when we go out, uh, oh yeah, I just forgot to introduce myself to Swart. So, <laughs> I'm with Ministry of Forests. I'm the research geomorphologist for the northwest part of the province, so I study the interactions between land use and earth surface processes. And uh, that's why I like flying drones. And uh, so often when we're out in the woods, though, um, often we just want to take a picture, so we just take that beautiful, fantastically composed aerial shot. Sometimes we want to do an orthophoto or a DEM. But often it's just to kind of get a, an idea of the site, a bit of a characterization of the site or get a bit of a feeling for what the topography is. So sometimes we fly without ground control. So that, uh, that solution may be a little bit incorrect in terms of scale, and it may be shifted slightly relative to the other, to other data, but typically the drone data is an order of magnitude better than any other data we have in our provincial database, and so uh, I find it uh, somewhat irrelevant. When we want to be really careful, that's when we have to put out ground control. So without, when we process without ground control that's based solely on the GPS or the GNSS that's on board the aircraft while it's flying. Okay, so continuing along with kind of our objectives of our, uh, of our study here is to look at the quality of the images that we get out of them, what the orthophotos look like, the ease of production, what the hardware requirements are, and uh, the analyst time versus the analysis time. So how much processing, how much time was the computer just worrying, creating heat? How much time was the uh, analyst creating heat? <laughs> Wrong mouse. Wrong mouse? Oh. Okay, 
see this one? So it's the most common uh, drone we have in our BC government fleet. Um, we flew a Mavic Pro. Uh, we flew a Phantom 3 4K, which is a bit of an older drone. We flew this custom ugly flying machine that I built. <laughs> and we flew this uh, Matrice uh, 210 RTK. That, uh, it's kind of our flagship, I guess, of the, of the province. So, so we have some issues right off the bat. One is that, um, so here I've uh, labeled them by the number of megapixels of their sensor, and as well as the sensor size. Because uh, if you're into photo photography at all, digital photography, you know that sensor size matters. Bigger the better. And um, so the, uh, the Phantom 4 Professional there was, uh, was kind of brought out because it had a one inch sensor. But it's actually, so you'd say, oh, one inch sensor, so that's either one inch diagonally or it's one inch across the bottom. But no, it's uh, the rectangle that fits within a one inch diameter circle. So it's actually quite a bit smaller. These uh, 12 megapixel cameras here on these drones, these are kind of the same as uh, you'd find in a typical point and shoot camera. This, uh, this custom drone I built to carry this specific camera. It's a 16 megapixel Rico and uh, has a APS-C sensor. So it's uh, about an inch across. And it's a very similar sensor on the Matrice 210 RTK. Okay, so the other consideration here, um, I mean, uh, not particularly for this project, but uh, in general, is, uh, is the price. So for these three, these uh, four kind of units, you know, you're, you're talking around you know, $2,000 to $3,000 to get fully set up with some extra batteries and cases and whatnot. And, uh, and that, that one over there is like sort of an order of magnitude more, at least half an order of magnitude more. <clears throat> okay, so these are, the, uh, these are the software packages that we ran all our data through. Uh, and so Photoscan, Global Map from Blue Marble, Pix4D, Esri's uh, drone map, couldn't actually find like a, a nice logo for it, but. Uh, it's there somewhere. Uh, Drone Deploy is an online service. Uh, Photo Modeler Technologies, a Vancouver-based company, and Open Drone Map, which is uh, an open source. And so then, uh, again, for price, uh, Drone Deploy you can start uh, really for free, uh, and then you can kind of subscribe and get more and more. Uh, then uh, Global Mapper comes up to about a thousand dollars to US, I think. Then uh, Photo Modeler, Photo Scan. Esri's drone map, and I'm not actually sure what Esri's drone map is. I'm sure some of the representatives can help us out if anybody's uh, curious. And then uh, Pix4D is kind of uh, twice it, again that. Uh, which leaves just open drone map, and so all you have to do is apply time. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is our, our piloting team at our piloting site. You can see here's the corner of the RP, RPK GPS uh, GNSS that we use to establish the ground control. So we set out 28 points uh, in advance of flying them, and uh, then we flew the drones over them. So we're all smiles because uh, we just finished six hours of watching drones fly by themselves over the same piece of ground. <laughs> and uh, you know, don't want to make it look too glamorous. It's bloody boring. You know? And there we have all our drones lined up on top of the truck. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the ground control was. Um, Expected to have an error of you know about the size of a golf ball, centimeter and a half sort of error. So we assumed that to be absolute for the remainder of the, the project. So uh, here's a snippet of the ortho photo, and uh, like I was saying, the ortho photos are a little bit difficult to uh, to present. They're really difficult to present in in uh, presentations. You know, I mean maybe I should be using it in uh, a different application so I can zoom in and out because that's really what the power of the uh, of the uh, of the product is, <clears throat> but here you go. Um, so you can see it's mixed forest, and uh, so we have some deciduous forest. Oh, I have a pointer. I keep saying. 
and uh, some coniferous forest, some open areas. Um, so the, uh, the selected points here that are circled in yellow, those are the, those are the uh, points that we selected to be ground control. So those are the ones that we let the uh, software know about so that they could solve their solutions based on those locations. So I selected just four. You can select up to six is a good idea. Beyond that, it becomes uh, a diminishing return. I selected four because often we don't want to put out any ground control points, so putting out four is easier than putting out six. I also put them, I elected to put them suboptimally, so we put them here. These ones are down at the edge of the project, but these we'll have to extrapolate to all these points up here. So that was, uh, that was on purpose. But it would have been easy to set them at the far end here, but decided not to. Um, right. Okay, so here we go. So we did actually 13 flights, 28 ground control points. So we're analyzing it through ground control and non-ground controlled solutions through seven different uh, photogrammetry applications. So it's like 5,100 coordinates that I have to like uh, collect. So I use QGIS, I pull the orthophoto and the DEM in, identify all the points, query the orthophoto for the coordinates, the, the, the salt coordinates, query the DEM for the elevation, and, uh, and we move on. But in my analysis, it's come that uh, I have a few errors. I think I uh, mistyped. Uh, my QGIS workflow involved me typing in the uh, ground control number, the target number. I think I screwed up on a couple of those, and so we have some errors. So you'll see that I expect that kind of affects some of my results, but we'll see. <coughs> right, so then it comes to, uh, so now we have all our data, and now we're ready to start running through the software applications, and so then the question comes, well, you know, how, how do you want me to do it on, on this program? Because this program does it this way, and apples, oranges, peaches, pears, bananas, they're all good for us, they're all fruit, but uh, they're all slightly different. So the way we attack, attack that was just to say, we're going to just go on the defaults. Okay, so, so some of these applications can do better. Uh, they could process it faster, they could process it slower, but we just went with the kind of defaults, medium settings. <clears throat> okay, so one of the first things you want to do is look at the, uh, the analysis of the residuals. So these are the analysis of my uh, UTM Eastings, of uh, the predicted <laughs> points. And uh, so I put it through a Shapiro Wilk. And what we see is that, um, yeah, so this one uh, not rejected, so it's reasonably expected that this is from a normal distribution. Good news, there was, was about, um, so of the 150 kind of analysis flights that we did, or analysis uh, runs, about, I don't know, 5% maybe passed the first time. So I was like, oh no, I was uh, quite distraught. <clears throat> Many of them failed like this. But to me, that looks uh, pretty normal over there. <laughs> and then there's this. So I started to, uh, to dig into this problem. And then it kind of uh, conjoined with another problem I have. And that's this. These are missed targets. So you, you flew over the same site, but some of the ortho photos you can see a target on, other photos you can't see a target on. Well, that's somewhat by design because I kind of put them near in the thick forest. So what we see is here that we can see uh, these, all these kind of high points, pretty much all of them, are it, uh, as a result of forest interactions. There are a couple others that have relatively high residuals that these I painted, uh, we painted targets on rocks, and those rocks had high reflectance, and it uh, blew out the uh, sensors for a lot of the cameras, so they were overexposed. Uh, so this is the kind of, uh, these are the kind of effects that we get. We get this sort of swirling that you see here and here. And then we also get the kind of solutions where the software is picking um, one photograph or another and see the effect of the trees kind of sort of lying down rather than always that nadir view. And so you can imagine the effect that if there was a ground control point in that view, how that's going to affect the solution. So as I went back and removed all those points that were had strong forest interactions, my residuals came off great. So that's, uh, that was good news, so I could carry on with the analysis. Okay, so, <clears throat> right, so here's um, removed 16, removed 18, removed 19, 20s in a patch of, uh, so th th this forest is over 10 to 12 meters high, 15 meters high. It's kind of a young uh, second-growth stand sort of 
and uh, this is kind of a clearing sort of eight meters wide. So we had, uh, we, uh, we succeeded there. Remove, remove, this one's acceptable, of course. Okay, so here's what the, the histogram of horizontal error for all the software, for all the points is. And you can see, so here we have the error in meters, and so we're kind of, seems reasonable, particularly in a forested environment. Uh, <clears throat> you can see that I think that this mean is somewhat skewed by the fact that we have these uh, very high residual points. And now, incorporating the Z factor, which is usually, uh, an, uh, you know, kind of double the error of the X and Y, and uh, you can see what we're at. So, comparing the drones, and I better hurry, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> what we see is the root main square errors are uh, really very similar. Median is very similar, and you see that stretch between the median and the mean because of the uh, high residual points. Uh, <clears throat> it's also important to note that the cameras weren't calibrated before processing. So this, we, they just dumped photos into the into the software. The software had to deal with calibrating the cameras on on route. If you want really good results, you should calibrate your cameras in advance, have that calibration set, then apply it. Uh, okay, so now we're just going to look through some pictures, and you guys can agree with me or disagree with me. So I've set them from uh, poorest quality to the highest quality. So here's the Phantom 3, Phantom 3 4K, and you can see we have uh, a snippet where we uh, I just blew up the bit of that truck. Uh, the Mavic Pro, you can see uh, a little bit less um, overexposure. <coughs> they seem to be um, Phantom 4 Professional, toned down somewhat, a uh, little better. Resolution, you're looking at the truck, but I look at the hood. <clears throat> this is the Zenus X7. This is on the, our super expensive drone. It's um, not materially better, I wouldn't say, than the Phantom 4 Pro. Uh, this is my survey drone with a, with a uh, forced camera parameter of uh, 1-800, which was a bit dark. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, little bit difficult to handle that which is why I typically fly a Phantom 4 Professional, not this one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, camera settings make a big difference, and so that's why for a lot of them we flew them on auto as well, because uh, typically a lot of people just fly on auto, they don't want to get into uh, setting those, those uh, advanced parameters, like setting the shutter speed, but here you can see that the auto and the 1-400 seem to come out relatively well. I think we should have flown it again at, uh, at maybe an 800. Okay, uh, onto the uh, software. Kind of a similar story. Uh, well, the roommate and mean square errors have quite a bit of variation there, um, but the, the medians relatively relatively close. The means as well. So uh, I, I expect because of those high residual errors that we could block those out. Look at these for now. Anyways, um, more analysis to come. And now let's run through the the. Uh, mapping products from the software. So these are all from the same flight. <clears throat> so these are all from the same set of images. So here's Global Mapper, Photo Modeler, Drone Deploy, Open Drone Map, Pix4D, Drone to Map, and I just saw Professional, which I felt was uh, looked to me to be the best. So the analysis analyst time was uh, typically 30 minutes to an hour for each of these projects. And um, the processing time varied from kind of like a, a less than an hour for Agisoft um, to greater than six hours as an average for Pix40. And this is again because of those, some of those settings. So on Agisoft you can dump it right down. Pix40 seems that the default seems like to be a higher standard. <coughs> Agisoft is also the only one that would run on a government issued computer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so the rest of the analysis went, was done on uh, photogrammetry devices or uh, or otherwise. Um, so this is kind of the sort of the computer that they were typically run on. Um, in terms of uh, production, like uh, drone deploy and open drone map, kind of had 100 megabyte files that do a full ortho photo. Um, global mapper was significantly smaller, about 10 megabytes. Uh, and then uh, Pix4D, drone to map, Agisoft, and uh, Photomod are all for kind of like about a gigabyte for this size. 
So default analysis in the forested setting, I, I don't see a lot of difference between those drones. So then comes that the best drone is the one in the air. It's not really the, the, not the big expensive one in the huge case that has to stay at the truck. It's the one that's in the back of the field vest that's actually out in the bush flying. And there's a minor difference between software solutions with respect to accuracy. And, uh, and I'm going to further check on that. And then with the qualitative, I think you can agree that there was a pretty considerable distance, difference between the, uh, the products at a qualitative level. That's it. Any questions for Matt? Are you publishing your results for folks to check out? Yeah, I hope to be, hope to be publishing those once we get those uh, high residuals sorted out. Yes. Okay. Are you partnering with UNBC for any more drill time this year? Yeah, I'd like to. I love working with those guys. Okay. Yeah, I think that here they're all right. <laughs> <laughs> Alex? Yeah, so, I mean, those are some pretty interesting findings, right? I have a little Mac Pro, you know, what I've got to go drones, but I always think I should upgrade and get something fancy, you know, pitch a big project, 15 grand, 20 grand, but the results you're showing is the Matrice to the Mavic Pro for, you know, the one meter sort of relative accuracy of the overall DM, you know, like, right, are very fair. Yeah, it's pretty, it seems to be pretty low from what, what we found. Yeah. But the one thing is that uh, the qualitative, your, your drone doesn't take great pictures, right? right? So then your upgrade is to go to a Mavic 2 Pro, which is absent from here because we didn't have one in government yet. So we didn't have one available to test. Yeah. So that would really be the, the drone to test next and see how that comes out because uh, it does have a, uh, a one inch sensor, meaning uh, 116 square millimeters really. Well, you can uh, partner with TACO then, they've got a pretty well there. Right, great. <laughs> sure do. Let's do it. <laughs>